Uh, everybody knows uh, uh, Dr. Dudo. He's uh, the head of thoracic endoscopy unit uh, in the Department of Thoracic Oncology, Pleural Disease and Interventional Pulmonology in the Hospital Nord in, in Marseille, in France. He's one of the most uh, skilled and talented uh, interventional pulmonologists, and he has a huge experience uh, in the management of malignant uh, central airway obstruction. So thank you so much, uh, Herbe. And also we have uh, Dr. Bolufer. He's a consultant thoracic surgeon in, uh, in Alicante, so he will uh, participate later on in the discussion of this uh, in this uh, session. So thank you, uh, Sergio, and thank you so much, Herbe, for having uh, uh, for uh, being here with uh, with us. And I'm sure that we we're going to learn a lot of you. Okay. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, muchas gracias. Como le he dicho, me gustaría presentar en castellano, pero me voy a decir tonterías. Es mejor que consigue en, en, en inglés. Uh, pero hay un problema, no puedo... I, I cannot share my, my screen. Yeah, we are going to give you the... Yeah. Yeah, uh, Herbe, try to share. Uh, just okay. click in the yeah, click in the in this. Uh, do you see? Do you see my presentation? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, you can start. Herbe. Okay. So again, thank you very much, uh, Andres. Uh, I remember that you you came for training in Marseille. Uh, well, now a long time ago, but you know, time flies. And so, thank you very much for to to allow me to to present about uh, <clears throat> radio bronchoscopy and more largely therapy bronchoscopy in malignant central airway obstruction. So yeah, some, some, some pictures about Marseille to, to remind you uh, that finally it has changed because when you came, this place didn't exist. It's a museum, the Musée, it's, it's nice. And, and when you came, we were located in the south of Marseille and now we are in the north of Marseille uh, in the what we call the hottest <laughs> uh, suburbs of Marseille, but it's okay. So uh, let's talk about, uh, introduce the problem of malignant airway obstruction. Uh, just to remind you that um, lung cancer is, is the first cancer uh, in terms of incidence for in men and, and close to bees in, in women. And we know from previous studies that um, almost one patient on three <clears throat> will present a central airway obstruction due to cancer. 30% were, uh, this, this, this number come from uh, studies, uh, I would say 20 years ago. Now uh, it's closer to 14% in a, in, a, in a more recent studies of my friend David Breen from Ireland. And there is a, real, a reason why, you know, um, the cancer, uh, lung cancer has evolved evolved from a central squamous cell carcinoma to more peripheral adeno adenocarcinoma due to uh, the change in, 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 in tobacco habits. Uh, in the past, you said more people were smoking dark tobacco, uh, and now it's more blonde tobacco with filters. So now cancer are more peripheral than, than central. And the, the obsession can be either endoluminal, strictly, strictly endoluminal, strictly extrinsic, extrinsic operation, and in some cases it can be mixed, so a certain part of uh, endoluminal growing and external compression. We know that this patient have, if we do nothing, uh, reduced survival, very a very bad quality of life, and in addition, this obstruction jeopardizes oncologic treatment like chemotherapy and radiotherapy due to respiratory failure, recurrent pulmonary infections, and atelectasis. Atelectasis uh, can uh, disturb uh, radiotherapy, for instance, in order to, to target the, 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 the cancer itself. So, and we know, and, and we know from also uh, literature that if you expect radiotherapy and chemotherapy to relieve the obstruction, but you, you will be disappointed in, in most of the cases because you will have a, a relief of uh, atelic disease and compression in about 20%. So it's too low. To, 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 to only count on, uh, on oncologic treatment. Recently, uh, two years ago, we have started a, a register in France, which uh, the French group is called the GETIF, Group d'Endoscopie Thoracic International Francophone. And so we, this register is about ridge bronchoscopy 
only only reciprocoscopy in malignant central airway obstruction. So this is a this are the epidemiological data on one one thousand patients. What is it? What is uh, interesting to, to notice is that most of the patients are non small cell lung cancer, and uh, still the squamous cell carcinoma is the most important. Adenocarcinoma a little bit less. Uh, we also have uh, extrathoracic obstruction due to metastasis, some uh, rare disease like adenoid, adenoid cystic carcinoma. But what is very interesting to notice is that 44% uh, of the people who need uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy because of obstructive cancer are naive from any oncologic treatment. In other words, a, a big amount of patients enter the disease with a symptomatic obstruction. And this is a very, I, I, honestly, I, I didn't realize that it was that much, but uh, close to one patient on two is naive from onc any oncologic treatment. So that's very interesting to, 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 to notice. So uh, due to the fact that we cannot rely on uh, oncologic treatment to relieve obstruction, international bronchoscopy can palliate symptomatic uh, central level obstruction. And I insist on the word symptomatic at each step, each step of the disease, so neoadjuvant, which is a, a lot of people, adjuvant, and of course, unfortunately, in, in palliative care. Uh, I won't insist that much on the technique, uh, but uh, just with one slide, I, I just uh, re resume, summarize, uh, what is the technique, the recommended technique, not only by us, but uh, also by uh, societies, international societies, for uh, first endoluminal lesions. So you, you see a, a tumor inside of the trachea. The tumor has been devascularized with laser and then is core out with a bevel of the rigid bronchoscope. So a big piece of tumor is removed with a rigid forceps. And after, at the end, you just have to um, coagulate the base of the tumor with laser. So this is what we call the laser assisted mechanical debulking. But you know, uh, you know, Andres, that in Marseille we have also we have also been pioneer in, in with laser due to doc, uh, thanks to Dr. Dumont. But this can this thing also can be uh, achieved with thermocoagulation, argon plasma, uh, argon plasma also. So it's just the, the hot technique just assists the mechanical debulking, which is the most important part of of, of the treatment. Uh, with interventional bronchoscopy, you, you can expect uh, immediate debulking in uh, close to 90%, lung function benefit. Duration of, of, the, of, the, of the procedure is about three months before recurrence, uh, except in naive patients, but we'll come back to that. Survival is, is, is probable, but because there is no study comparing no desobstruction compared to desobstruction, you reduce the risk of uh, acute respiratory failure. And the vital risk in the literature is, is low, uh, but it, it exists. Uh, sorry. Uh, what about stenting? Stenting in malignancy. The uh, major indication is excess incompression because there is no other things to do endoscopically, just to put something in the airway to counteract with the pressure due to the tumor, like here in the, in the carina. So excess incompression is the only thing you can do endo, uh, endoscopically. But there can be also an indication of stenting in case of obstruction of more than 50% of the lumen after the working of the interesting part of the disease. Again, clinical benefit is, is important. Many studies have, uh, have pro has proven it in lung function, quality of life. And again, last a little bit more than uh, uh, debulking alone, about four months before the tumor grows uh, at the proximal or the distal part of the, of the stent. Uh, Rigid bronchoscopy, because it's that's a matter of the, of, the, of the presentation, is probably the most important tool. And you see a, a paper in 2015 by Mahmoud and, and Hal uh, uh, from uh, America. Again, good result in spirometry, dyspnea, quality of life, improves uh, improvement regardless of the underlying cause of central airway disease. And they insist on the fact that rigid bronchoscopy really secures the airway you can achieve maximal debulking compared to just flexible bronchoscopy. And rigid bronchoscopy allows you to place silicon stent. Silicon stent, if you want to place them, and 
and Silicon Stent are the most placed in the world yeah, still, uh, but require rigid bronchoscopy. You cannot place Silicon Stent without a rigid bronchoscope. Something which is very important and, and has been showed by uh, uh, Prashant Shajed, uh, is an Indian physician, but at the time he was working in Switzerland. If you take two groups of patients of suffering from uh, cancer at the same stage of the disease, one group had a central airway obstruction successfully treated by uh, endoscopy. And the other group, again, at the same stage, and no central airway obstruction. But so if you are successful in, 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 in relieving the obstruction, then you offer the same uh, survival as, uh, com as compared to the group without. By the way, you no know, survival is not very good, but we know, we know that with lung cancer. Uh, something very important to, 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 to say now is the difference, the, the gap between what the operator will, will deem as a success, technical success, and the clinical improvement. This data comes from uh, the American re Registry, which is called ACQUIRE, uh, published in 2015. And you see in blue, that's uh, the high percentage of success uh, estimated by the uh, operator, and the success is defined as reopening the airway to more than 50% of, of normal. So very high. but at the same time, if you look at uh, clinical improvement, uh, symptoms are improving uh, close to 50% and quality of life only 42%. So it's, uh, it's, it's very surprising to, to see, not, not that it's surprising, but uh, a big difference between technical success and clinical success. By the way, uh, even if it has never been published, most of the experts know what is a prerequisite for a successful procedure, technical successful procedure. So this is the, the, all the items are very important. First, the obstruction has to be proximal. So it has to, to, to affect trachea, mens and bronchi, eventually bronchus intermediates. And you see it, it ex excludes lobar obstruction because some, most of the lobar obstruction are not symptomatic. And again, we, I insist on the fact that this procedure is a symptomatic treatment. Without symptoms, there is no need to uh, do a, a read bronchoscopy. The disease has to be localized, like you know, in this uh, case of uh, compression of, uh, of the rhinus and bronchus. We need functional bronchi and lung parenchyma behind the obstruction. We need a functional pulmonary artery, and we need the patient to have a performance status enough to enjoy the clinical benefits. So this is a prerequisite for a successful procedure, but it's not always easy to, 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 to estimate. So in other words, if you have this situation with a patient with a, a complete atelectasis of the right lung, is it this situation where you will have success in your procedure because you will uh, remove the endoluminal part and, and even right upper lobe and broken intermediates are, are, are safe, so you will be successful? Or is it this situation when you have a big mass coming from the uh, distality to the proximality, and then uh, in this case, you, you won't find any safe bronchus, safe uh, parenchyma behind. So is there clinical predictive factors? Uh, yes, probably, at least in my practice, and I will uh, uh, speak about clinical data, imaging, and endoscopic aspects. Again, it's a symptomatic treatment. And more the patient are symptomatic, probably more the patient will benefit from, from, uh, from this technique. So a patient with an acute or subacute dyspnea, and, and, prob and probably the best patient is a patient who are intubated because of the obstruction. Uh, so that means that there is a sudden obstruction of the proximal airway, and so before that, presence of functional parenchyma. You know, in those cases of progressive dyspnea or even absence of dyspnea or only on exertion, this is generally represents an obstruction coming from the distality to, to, to the central airway. And so in these cases, most of the time, you won't be successful. Uh, just as a proof, a paper in 2008 uh, by a Belgian group of 24 patients, all successfully debulked, all successfully debulked, most of the patients had a severe uh, uh, dyspnea before and after uh, much lower. 
a very important uh, uh, study, uh, recent study uh, from, from France, that I, I, I had the chance to be the first author of that, is the first randomized trial interpreting bronchoscopy in cancer. It has been called SPOC, silicon prosthesis in obstructive lung cancer. The question was, you have an obstruction, malignant obstruction, you debug. You, are, you, have, you have successfully debugged the patient. And now the question is, do we have to place a stent to prevent local recurrence, but we expose the patient to stent-related complications, or uh, do we don't place a stent? The patient won't be uh, exposed to stent-related complication, but will theoretically uh, exposed to uh, local recurrence. So it was a prospective study, and we had to randomize the patient in the operating room after, after the bronchoscopy. So granted by the National Institute, uh, nine French university centers, and we have uh, uh, included only 78 patients. And why? Only because we wanted much more. Because before inclusion, we needed to have the histology of the cancer, and we needed to know which treatment will be proposed after. And as I told you, 44% of people who need this kind of procedure are naive from uh, any oncology treatment. So I've never been evaluated in, even in, for TNM, we don't know the histology, so we have no idea about what will be the treatment after. That's explained why we had uh, finally enrolled so many, so few people. So again, the algorithm, inoperable non-small cell lung cancer with symptomatic, symptomatic obstruction, and for concern, we do the bronchoscopy. We are successful because we have more than 50% of the lumen and we can stand all the tumor with the stent and we randomize stent versus no stent. And we will follow up after. So the, sorry, the main endpoint was survival without local recurrence and secondary endpoint survival, quality of life, restenosis and tolerance of the stent. But why I want to show you this, paper, this study is because of that. Look at the Borg score before, the mean Borg score before. And I remind you that all the patients have been successfully debulked uh, uh, to be, to be uh, included. So the Borg score is very high before, so between six and seven. And after it, it reduces a lot, dramatically reduces. And of course, after, after time, uh, increase uh, because of recurrence of, of the tumor. So uh, what we, we found in this, this paper is that uh, to, to answer the question about stenting or not stenting, there is no need, no need to place a stent in a patient naive from uh, oncology treatment. So in a patient who has never been treated, you just debug and then you send the patient to the oncologist and, and hopefully uh, there, there won't be that high uh, recurrence rate. But in all of the patients, failure of first line or other lines, yes, there is uh, interest in putting a stent to reduce recurrence and to improve quality of life. And this is a conclusion of the SPOC study. Interventional bronchoscopy improved for long periods of quality of life. The barrier effect of silicon stenting is obvious and delays the restenosis of about three months. In patients where first-line chemotherapy or chemo irradiation is possible, there is, this effect is not significant. The tolerance of silicon stent is excellent. No impact on quality of life. So the conclusion of the study is that we could recommend uh, putting a stent in case of failure of a first line. Um, and and th th this publication has been performed before, you know, uh, the new therapies in cancer, uh, like uh, immuno immuno immunotherapy and all, all these new lines. Uh, now imagine, of course, if you uh, have a patient who has an uh, important dyspnea, sorry, and uh, and you see that you see the airway, it's it's clear that you you have an obstruction, but be, below there you see the airways, you see lung uh, safe and functional parenchyma, then this patient will be will, will benefit from uh, from the from the procedure. It's clearly the absence of our recent atelectasis. That means that uh, just before the atelectasis, you have a, uh, a CT scan, for instance, and on the CT scan, you see that uh, you had safe airway. This is a very good factor of, uh, of uh, good result, clinical result. 
in case of atelectasis, by the way, a CT scan can help you uh, eventually to differentiate the tumor from, from the atelectasis, to see the vessels, to eventually to see a bronchogram, see this kind of aspect which are, uh, are quite negative in terms of uh, prognosis, and to estimate compression or the invasion of uh, the pulmonary artery. PET scan also, uh, in case of that atelectasis, can help you to differentiate the tumor here and the atelectasis here. So you can estimate if uh, the tumor is localized or more diffuse. Endoscopic aspect is also very important. And the tumor implantation is uh, clearly a, uh, one of the of pronostic factor. In other words, if it's pedicular, it will be much more easier to, to cut. Uh, still, this kind of tumor is quite easy to, 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 to remove. But when you have this kind of aspect, more spread, more, more invasion, um, but of course, uh, there is uh, less chance to, to, to find a safer way behind that. Uh, during bronchoscopy, uh, uh, during bronchoscopy, there is something that can be useful when you have a complete obstruction, for instance, in this case. And here, this is a section catheter uh, here that helps you to, to palpate the lesion and to find a way below. Uh, and look, when you see that, when you see that pus is coming in transparency through the suction, that uh, means that you have uh, bronchus behind. Uh, filled with secretion, and that's a, a, predict, a, a, predict, uh, a good positive predictive factor to, for, for debulking. You can also use a flexible bronchoscope to pass below, you inject saline, and try to see if you have a, a safe airway. Uh, the localization, again, of the tumor is very important. This, com this data comes from a previous study of uh, uh, Dr. Dumont uh, in the 90s. Better, uh, more the lesion is, is, is proximal, better are the results, trachea, right medicine bronchus, and of course, more you go distal, and above all in the upper lobes, less you will be successful in, 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 your, in your procedure. Dr. Dumont used to say that it's because uh, upper lobes are not uh, reachable, amenable to reach bronchoscopy. I don't think it's a, that's the main, main reason. The main reason is that uh, if you just have a lower obstruction, it's much more difficult to, to, to find below, behind the obstruction a safe bronchi and, and safe parenchyma. So uh, just uh, two cases, two cases to illustrate that. So you have a patient with uh, uh, quite dysmeic, uh, dysmeic uh, uh, like seven uh, at the box K, obstruction of the bronchus intermedius with a, a squamous cell carcinoma. But we know because of the CT scan that middle lobe and, and lower lobe uh, are ventilating. So we have to try the disobstruction. And in Marseille, uh, I guess, unless you remember that we, we use laser, but we use laser not to vaporize the tissue, but to uh, devascularize the tissue before mechanical debulking. So this is why laser achieves this kind of blanching effect uh, rather than you know, vaporizing the tissue. And then uh, after, so laser, we know that laser goes quite de deep in, in below the surface, like four millimeter uh, below the surface. So we achieve a good coagulation compared to other techniques. And when we deem that uh, coagulation is good enough, we go to coring the, the, the endolminal part of the, of the tumor. So we can remove a big piece of tumor this is very important, of course, to follow the axis of the lumen to avoid perforation, but this is a practice and experience. Then you remove the endoluminal part of the tumor with a suction. At the end, some laser, and I don't know if you see, there is a middle lobe here and the lower lobe here, and some laser to reduce bleeding. And at the end, because of persisting uh, compression, we added a stent silicon stent, uh, and the silicon stent was opened by, with balloon, uh, disposable balloon. You have different techniques to open a stent. You can use rigid tubes also. Uh, but what is important, if you do airway stenting, is that it's always good to have a stent folded once inserted, 
because if it opens too nicely, it will migrate. So it, we have to struggle with the stent to open it. So again, a case, a successful case because all the prerequisite was there. In, in this case, uh, complete obstruction of uh, left lung uh, on the on this X-ray, which is uh, as you can see here. On the on the CT scan, you see that uh, the obstruction, by the way, is not very proximal in the left mesenchymal bronchus. But you see also many things. Uh, you see uh, that you have lung uh, fluid per per effusion, and you also see that the pulmonary artery is completely compressed, invaded. In event, even even the, the heart here is invaded. And I remind you, this patient is not that symptomatic. I would say paradoxically, it's not very symptomatic. So you, a PET scan shows that, well, the disease is quite localized, but very bad localized, uh, you know, at, at, the, at, the, at the secondary carina uh, on the left side, but again, invading uh, the heart here and the big vessels. So. The bronchoscopy was performed not uh, in a therapeutic uh, uh, with a therapeutic objective, but just for for diagnostic and and just to confirm that you have no possibility to have to find a safer way behind the obstruction. So two cases to illustrate. So now comes my conclusion. Conclusion is that uh, um, you know in in 2013 the ACCP has has published recommendation. Uh, for lung cancer, and 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 they they, they wrote that uh, for patient inoperable with inoperable disease and symptomatic airway obstruction, and you see every time the, the word symptomatic is there, therapeutic bronchoscopy employing mechanical debridement, tumor ablation, or airway stent placement is recommended to improve dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis, and overall quality of life. Grade is one C. Uh, Question remains regarding technical success rate, which is quite high. Uh, uh, it seems that in France we are not that high compared to America, but it's it's still high and higher than clinical uh, improvement. Improvement symptoms, uh, spirometry and quality of life has been proven now. Timing of airway stenting, uh, we start to have some answers uh, uh, thanks to our Spock study and. Uh, Still, we don't do re, re, very well about survival benefit related to our uh, So now, right now, I'm working uh, with my colleagues on uh, the clinical predictive factors for uh, su successful uh, debulking. We have, a, thanks to the register, a lot of data, and I hope that in, in, in the full next month, I, I, will, I will, I could publish something interesting. But still. We follow the rules of uh, this Professor Wood. We have to do a procedure when it's clinically meaningful. So again, symptomatic and highly symptomatic patient and technically feasible, meaning we have uh, the prerequisites that I, I, I told you. But sometimes in daily practice, this is a try and see uh, uh, te techniques that we, we, we do, uh, except in obvious cases of pr probable failure like absence of dyspnea and uh, suggestive imaging. And if just to, to end, this is the algorithm now we, we, we propose. You have, uh, you, 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 you estimate airways, parenchyma, and pulmonary artery. If they are uh, safe, if they are not safe, not safe, you, you don't consider interventional bronchoscopy. So you just do a diagnostic bronchoscopy to have, a, to have this histology. But if they are uh, safe, then you have two situations. As I said, extensive obstruction, and then the only solution is stenting. Except, except in some very chemosensible uh, lesions like small cell carcinoma, but uh, very uh, rare, or lymphoma. Uh, if you have intrinsic or mixed obstruction, you debulk. If you have less than 50% after debulking, again, you place a stent. If you have more than 50% of, of, of lumen after, uh, after the burking and the patient is naive from oncology treatment, you don't place a stent. If he, is, he failed, if a first line failed, then you will place a stent. This is now what we can propose uh, for, for the management. And before my, uh, now my last slide uh, is, uh, Andres, I'm sure that you know that next year, we uh, have a chance to organize a World Congress of International Bronchoscopy 
in Marseille, in a very nice place, the, the Palais du Faro, a very nice uh, area, very nice venue, and we hope that you could attend. Uh, uh, I'm about to say in presence, but uh, I'm less and less confident with the COVID now, but uh, we hope you could join us. Bye. Oh. Thank you so much, Herbert, uh, Herbert for this uh, amazing uh, lecture. So now we are going to start the, <clears throat> the discussion and we are going to start to comment some key points uh, about uh, the management of uh, the central uh, malignant airway obstruction. So for the discussion, we, we have to, uh, we have here Sergio. Sergio Volper, as uh, I said before, is a consultant traffic surgeon in, uh, in Alicante and also is here as a vice president of the Spanish um, Society of uh, Thoracic Surgeon. Uh, since a few weeks ago, we, we have a nice collaboration with the Spanish Society of Thoracic Surgery. So all these uh, lectures, we are going to be uh, uploading the, in a new online platform that the, the, the society uh, has. So uh, welcome, Sergio, and uh, you are free to, to start the, uh, the discussion. Yes, uh, you are mute now. Please put the microphone. OK, no. Thank you very much, Andres, for this kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today representing the Spanish Society of Thoracic Surgeons and congratulations uh, to all your uh, Santiago de Compostela team for the brilliant organization of these uh, Compostela Thorax Live Connections in collaboration with the Spanish Society of Thoracic Surgery and also with the new platform uh, called Campus Sect. Uh, we are trying... Uh, through this platform to provide uh, a wide range of contents uh, related to educational resources and specialized tools for all the thoracic surgery community uh, with the aim uh, of spreading uh, the knowledge between specialists and, and also the for the best for the benefit of patients so congratulations uh, of course to Herbe Duto for this excellent uh, presentation and I will introduce uh, some questions. The first one is, uh, Dr. Herbe, if you have uh, any experience with absorbable stents, with these new ones, stents, or only with silicone ones? That's the first uh, question. But, um, no, I don't have that much experience in, uh, with biodegradable stents. And uh, well, we, I've tried in animal studies to, to produce new stents in magnesium, but, but uh, well, we failed. Uh, the only existing biodegradable stent is, do, is, is done in polydioxanone. Polydioxanone uh, is, a, is a degradable material and lasts only three months. Three months, uh, I mean, in malignancy, uh, it's probably not a good indication because uh, uh, first, the price is high. Uh, the, the price of the stent is very, very high. And most of the patients, unfortunately, die before three months, most of them. So in uh, stenting in malignancy, in fact, the choice of the stent is not that important. It's not that important because, again, most of the patients die before stent-related stent complications. It's much more important the choice of the stand in benign conditions rather than in malignant. In benign, that's very, very important. But in, 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 uh, in malignancy, um, silicone or metallic or equal. Uh, but honestly, biodegradable, no, not, not in this case. No. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben. I have another question. Uh, when do you send patients for tracheal resection? I mean, not in cases of uh, metastatic disease or just in primary tumors like squamous cell or adenoid cystic, which yeah. are your, your indications uh, to send patients for surgery? Mm. <clears throat> well, uh, as, as you mentioned, it's a quite rare situation. Uh, so in Marseille, we have very good surgeons, but uh, I mean, they, 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 they will probably uh, be able to do coronal resection uh, with reimplantation or these things. But uh, when, when the disease is very, is, above all in trachea is, is, is very large. Uh, I have a connection in Paris. Maybe, maybe you know, uh, Professor Martino in, in, in Avicenne, uh, and he does uh, tracheal replacement. 
with Aorta, Aorta Graft. And, and, and he's, he told me recently that it's probably more, one of the best indications for, for tracker replacement is this large adenocystic carcinoma, uh, because we know that uh, uh, except surgery, uh, oncologic treatment won't be, won't be uh, efficient. So Marseille, I would say for standard uh, bronchial uh, sleeve resection, but, uh, and, and also coronal resection, but uh, when it's too large, but uh, honestly, it's uh, one case every two, two years, maybe. So uh, refer to Paris. Okay, that's perfect. And, and last question, uh, what kind of laser do you use? Uh, I mean, it's um, one better than the others or depend on the indications, what, what kind of laser? Ah, so, so uh, for, for people who don't know what is laser, uh, in fact, there is no, there, there is lasers, not only one, uh, as, you, as you said, because each laser uh, has its own uh, wavelengths. It's, it's a light, in fact, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beam of photons. Um, uh, the first lasers most uh, used in, in, in interpretive microscopy were uh, lasers in the infrared, in the, if you look at the light spectrum. So mainly YAG laser and, and uh, YAP laser and diode laser. Uh, now we use a diode laser, but it's a special one because it combines two wavelengths, two. So uh, we can mix uh, the two wavelengths and so we can on the same screen and, and, and now the, the, the laser is very small. In the past, when Dr. Dumont started with laser, it was so big that it could not be uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the room. It has to be in a room close to you, to, to the operating room and with a, with a window and in the wall just to, with, with, with the arm of the laser and the, and, 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 and the, and the, and the fiber optic. So now it's small and so on the screen I can switch, I can change my patterns so I can have like 15 watts with only wavelengths and I have very nice coagulation. And then if I want to vaporize, I, I, I increase uh, the one wavelength to like 40 watts. And with 40 watts, you, 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 you vaporize, vaporize tissue. Yeah. So I have, with one laser, I can do whatever I want. And that's, uh, of course, it's uh, still more expensive than, uh, than thermal coagulation, but it's not, in the past, it was like, one 150,000 euros, but now it's close to 40,000 euros. But it's still much more expensive, but it's more versatile. You can do much more things with lasers and other techniques. Uh, we have the, the same laser here in Alicante, and I think we could achieve uh, very, very, uh, yeah. very good results. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it, it's used for surgery also, for surgery, open surgery. You yeah, metastasectomy and other yeah. procedures, yeah. Uh, uh, so Andres, that's, uh, these are my questions. I mean, do you have any other question from, from there? Thank you, Sergio. Uh, any questions? Uh, no, no questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hervé, for sharing with us your few experience. No, it's, it's... We, appreciate, we appreciate your support in connecting uh, with us today. Uh, I would like to insist in the kind, in the kind of stance you use for, for these procedures. Because I think that you prefer uh, silicone stents, uh, tumor type stents, I mean. Um, why do you prefer those? Uh, why? Uh, why? 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 Uh, uh, metallic or expandible uh, stents. Well, uh, it's, not, it's not that, that much a question of, I prefer, but it's true that uh, I have more experience, even though um, now, you know, since you came, we have changed a little bit our practice because like 65, 65% of the stand we place are silicone. And so 35% of the stand are metallic now, but they are fully covered, fully covered metallic stand. Uh, and I insist on that um, because the most known uh, metallic stand is the Ultraflex from Boston Scientific. And you know, the Ultraflex is not covered at uh, Two, two tips of the, of the stand. So we don't use this one. We use a fully covered, so covered from the one, one extremity to the other. And what, uh, it, in fact, the choice depends on the, on the characteristic of the, of the disease. But the, the main advantage of uh, silicone is that you can customize the stand. You can cut each branch, uh, you can cut the stand according to your need and it, it, 
essentially the Y stance, you know, uh, Y stance, you can cut each branch uh, to, 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 to according to what you need. And this is something that you cannot do with, uh, with, with, with metallic. So first is the capacity to do on-site customization of the stand. Then we have better indication for metallic, like uh, if you want to stand a curvilinear lesion curve, if there is a curve, it's better to place metallic because silicon stands are straight and they remain straight and they won't take any curve. Uh, in case of malignant fistulas, we also prefer metallic stand because we can, uh, metallic stand adapt better to the wall. They, they fit better, so they, are, they reduce better the leaks in case of uh, the fragile fistula. So it's not only, uh, only uh, silicone, but given that we do debulking with a rigid bronchoscope and that then we can play silicone sensor, <laughs> that's why also we, we do it. And, and they are less expensive. So it's not 100% silicone, but it's true that it's more silicone than metallic. And Herbe, just to continue with this stent, uh, how do you do the follow-up? Uh, and when, when do you replace this stent? But uh, in malignancy, uh, replacing is not <laughs> is not very frequent. By the way, it's it can happen that we remove uh, that, that we place a stent and we know that it will be temporary, like uh, rare cases of uh, patient uh, either with huge huge dyspnea or even intubated due to lymphoma, due to small cell carcinoma. We place a stent to to win them from mechanical ventilation, and then after. When chemo works, after chemo works, we remove the stand. But in other cases, uh, most of the patient again die. So that means that the, what the question is more uh, interesting in benign, in benign conditions, and in benign condition, we the rule is to to place a stand, and then we we tell the patient that <clears throat> we will change you the stand in one year change or remove the stent in one year. Uh, because the only way to know if the stent is still needed is to remove it. Otherwise, we, we don't know it. So this is what we say to the patient. Do, so we, in one year, we will uh, change or remove your stent. In the meantime, you have to do nebulization of saline, blah, blah, blah. We, we, are, we, are, we don't uh, schedule routine bronchoscopy. Uh, we, 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 our rule is that if the patient is uh, symptomatic, 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 symptomatic I, I, can, I have no symptoms. That means that the stent behaves well. So we have no reason to, to do a routine bronchoscopy if the patient is asymptomatic. But we say to the patient, in case of uh, dyspnea, uh, important coughing, then you, 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 you phone us and you come back. So no routine bronchoscopy, change or remove at one year, and uh, uh, call if you have uh, symptoms. Well, and have you uh, had any complications? Uh, I mean, with metallic ones like granulomas, uh, stenosis, migration, or something like that. Well, you know, uh, when you place a stent in the airway, you you know, you know, you are almost sure that we'll have to face complications. <laughs> almost sure, above all in in benign, in benign condition. So that's why I, when, when I speak about stenting, I always say that stenting is, is a palliation. It's not it's the same meaning as in, 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 in malignancy, uh, but palliation in my mind means that you palliate the absence of a more definitive treatment, medical or surgical. So as you have no medical or surgical options, then you have an endoscopic option, but it's not ideal. Uh, uh, because you will have, you, you will probably have complication. And in my conclusion about our stenting is uh, uh, about the ideal stent. And I used to say that the ideal stent is the one you don't place, because uh, you, you won't have any problems with uh, with the stent. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, I have another uh, another question. <clears throat> That um, I heard a nice sentence from uh, Dr. Dumont that said that uh, you will become a, a real interventional pulmonologist once you face a, a massive uh, bleeding, right? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, successfully for sure. Uh, yeah, of course. So, yeah, so um, we need uh, some advice from you uh, in this kind of situation, some tips and tricks when you have a, a bleeding and uh, you know, how do you control and give some advice, please. But first, 
first, uh, you will be much more comfortable with the rigid, you know, because if massive bleeding around, uh, uh, happens during the flexible bronchoscopy, then it's a real mess because you have no other options than suctioning, but you cannot do more than suctioning. But see, you, you can ask your nurses to call the intensivist, of course, uh, or the priest eventually, but, uh, but uh, you have to wait the intensivist for uh, uh, selected intubation. With a rigid, uh, you can do things you, you know, you have the independent suction. So you, the suction can control the bleeding because it's large enough to control the bleeding. I have a nice video on that, but not in this presentation, but so you can control the bleeding and alongside in parallel to your suction, you can ask your nurse to, to, to give you uh, the laser fiber, for instance, and start to, to coagulate what, what is bleeding. But really in case of massive bleeding, uh, and, and I have an experience, uh, that we published quite recently, it was a uh, uh, bronchial, uh, bronchial uh, anast an left sorry left anastomotic stenosis after left transplantation, but very narrow. And I started to 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 dilate with the stenosis with my rigid bronchoscope, and at one point, poof, everything became red, red. You know, a massive bleeding. And I don't my reflex. I had a reflex. It wasn't the reflex was not to 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 pull out my bronchoscope, but to go down. I mean, to, to, to go distal in direction to the less lower lobe. And so in that way, my real bronchoscope has made a tamponade of, uh, of what, what, what was bleeding, you know? And in fact, it was a pulmonary artery that, that broke in the airway. And um, so I was intubated, I, uh, the, the patient was ventilating on the left lower lobe only. So we call the, the surgeons, we call the intensivist. And uh, and, the, well, and the surgeon said, "Well, no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not worrying that much. It's probably a tear, mucosal tear. Said, Can you go out?" I said, okay, okay, I go out from the lower lobe, and then I go. I went out, and pff, again, massive bleeding. So pff, down again. And so uh, I decided that if I was able to to to, to control the bleeding by by compression of uh, of the of, the, of this area, I will place a stent, fully covered metallic stent. And this is what I did. I placed a stent, so I, the, the bleeding stopped, and we sent the, uh, so we could, uh, uh, after that, remove the rigid bronchoscope, intubate the patient, send the patient to the interventional radi radiology, where they placed uh, a stent in the pulmonary artery. So the patient had, at the end had two stents, one in the pulmonary artery and one in the, in the, in the bronchus. So this is what Dr. Dumont wanted to say, you know, uh, uh, you are, uh, finally, I, 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 I am a real international bronchoscopist because I have this kind of reflex uh, and, and, and uh, of course, it's, a, it's, 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 he was teasing me, of course, but it's not, of course, mandatory to, uh, to, to face uh, uh, massive hemorrhage, but you know that it can happen. It can happen above all when you do malignant debulking, when you do uh, secondary uh, Malignancy like uh, renal cancer, carcinoids, it bleeds a lot. So you, 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 you are, uh, with, uh, with rigid bronchoscopy, laser, we have tools to, to face this kind of situation. Just to, just to add, Hervé, uh, we use also uh, bronchial blockers. Yeah. In these cases, to put uh, the blocker inside the, the, the main stem bronchus and to taponate the, these bronchus mm -hmm. just to control the situation. And also to to do a hemostasis of the of the, of the again wh whatever whatever what you use the most the, the result is, is the most important <laughs> yeah that's it and that's my, my last question is about the uh, organization of this uh, unit because you know in Spain I mean there are not a lot but several uh, departments that are doing uh, uh, really bronchoscopy sometimes uh, most of the time pulmonary and thoracic surgeons. But uh, the volume is not too is not too high, so do you think that we uh, would be better to do like reference uh, uh, departments for sending all these patients instead of have a lot of uh, departments that are doing low volumes? Yes, yes, I I, I do believe that. Uh, I, I think that rather than 
multiplying centers with low volume, it's much better to have uh, one center with uh, high experience and high volume. That's clearly my, my, my position. Uh, and the other thing is that the surroundings is very important. What I mean is that clearly our best friends are thoracic surgeons. Uh, and, and it's not only words, you know, in Marseille, we are, I, I, my, even myself, I feel more a surgeon than a pulmonologist in my practice. You know, I work in a main, cent, main operating uh, theater. Uh, I'm not too far from them. So uh, they are my best friends, clearly. But, but uh, you, you, you know that uh, uh, they need us, you know, Thoracic, uh, thoracic surgeons need more need endoscopy much more than we need them. But when when we need them, uh, it's very 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 important in, in, in emergency. So and uh, thoracic surgeon yes, and Inter intensivist of course, and interventional radiology. So these three uh, uh, parts have to be very strong: interventional pulmonology, thoracic surgery, radiology. Four, four, because intensivists also have to be uh, strong too. So and I don't think that. Uh, a lot of centers can afford that, you know, uh, to have these uh, four partners uh, working uh, in good collaboration and strong enough to to face and to 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 have a good quality uh, in terms of uh, of procedures and, and results. And Hervé, do you have any any airway board just to evaluate the cases and to decide what to, uh, what no. to do or how to treat? No, no, we don't have. We don't have. Uh, I mean, with thoracic surgeons and radiologists, and no, other specialties. No, 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 no. For 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 the indication of uh, of uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy, it relies only on, I would say, on me, but on, on us, because now I, I am the only one, but only on me. Uh, that's also an, an, an interesting because uh, see something something I didn't say in my presentation is that therapeutic bronchoscopies in some cases can. Uh, downstage uh, the, the disease, you know, you think that the patient is stage four or, so, or eventually uh, T4 or stage four, but after debulking, then we realize that the disease is much more localized and eventually surgery can be done. But then it's more, uh, you know, the uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, board for oncology, but not for uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy. Yeah, right. I see that uh, I received a lot of messages from the uh, amphitheater that they are probably expecting me. So, <laughs> I'm less, but uh, we have to go. Thank you. Thank you so, uh, so much. It was a really pleasure to have you here. And we, we learned a lot of, uh, of you. And for sure, we will keep in touch if you have any challenge case or whatever you can give me your advice. Also, thank you so much, uh, Sergio. I mean, it, uh, for sure, we'll be uh, continue collaborating with the, with the society, and it's for, for us a, a, a pleasure to, to, to contact you every, every single month. So thank you. Thank you so much both, and uh, thank you for participating in this nice session. Muchas gracias, Andrés. Y hasta luego. En Marsella, en Marsella el año próximo. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, I mean, if the pandemic will allow us to travel, and for sure. I mean, ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but you know, every year, every year we have a bad winter due to COVID, and then after it gets better because of summer. So, as the Congress will be early October, so hopefully it will be just before the next wave in winter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, hasta luego. Adios. Muchas gracias. Bye bye. Thank you.